Dr. Buckley here. I thought I'd provide you with some background on the physical properties lab that will help you out in the upcoming laboratory. In this lab, we have a few learning objective types of things we're after. We're after, uh, we're going to be looking at mostly, we're going to look at physical properties rather than chemical properties. To distinguish between those two, keep in mind the physical property is a property material which can be exhibited without the material undergoing some sort of change in composition. So, for example, boiling does not change the composition, measuring density does not change the composition, that sort of thing. A chemical property is something where you uh, hydrogen reacts with oxygen violently to form water. That's a chemical property of hydrogen. Now, if hydrogen and oxygen actually react to form water, that's a chemical change. We'll be focusing, once again, on the physical parts, physical properties that we see. The ones we're going to look at are boiling point, density, solubility, and I think I forgot to put in refractive index is the other one. We'll talk about that a little bit further on. What you'll do is we'll have a set of, un of known compounds and a set of unknown compounds. Each group will have one known compound and one unknown compound to work with. Your known compound data will be compiled on the board, so the class has some idea of what these properties are for acetone and whatever. And then you will also have an unknown compound that you'll use to find some other information about. Uh, this is just a summary of what I just told you. You'll have two compounds. One is a known, one is an unknown. The known compound will go on the board as a part of the class data, and the unknown, you'll look at the class data to see if you can figure out what that particular material is. <clears throat> you probably recall density. You've seen that several times, and the definition of it is, as we have it right here, it's just density is mass divided by volume. Measuring the density is a pretty straightforward process. The densities in these materials range a little bit, but they are all over the place. So it's not going to be your sole... Uh, your sole parameter that you can use to identify these materials. If we look a little bit more at density, a couple things I'd like to point out. One thing is when you do this experiment, you'll be doing three densities, three density measurements of the material in a 10 milliliter graduated cylinder. And the way that will work is you'll take and put like two milliliters in, read the volume carefully and record it, get the mass, put in three or four milliliters, another three or four milliliters, do that, and then all the way up to about 10 and get that and get your mass over volume that way to find your densities. Be very careful to pay attention to significant figures. You'll see we do this more and more as we go along. If you look at the volume on a graduated cylinder, those can usually be read to two decimal places, to the hundredths place. And so every time you put down a volume, for example, down here I have this 1.47 milliliter example, that's what you put down. You record to the hundredths place. You're guessing at that last digit. If it's right on a line, it might be something like a 3.0 or maybe you know 3.00, depending on where it is in that graduated cylinder and how it's marked off. In the balances that we use in the lab, they go to the hundredths place themselves. So every one of your mass measurements of the liquid will be to three significant figures. So when you take and you divide a three significant figure by another three significant figure, number, what you get is three significant figures. Your density needs to be to that many. It'll be 0.797 or 0.732 or something along those lines. And boiling point, I'm going to give you a background on that. In a liquid sample, the particles, the molecules, atoms, whatever you have in a liquid, are constantly leaving the liquid, and then vapor molecules above are constantly recondensing back in the vapor phase. And so <clears throat> what happens is the temperature of the liquid goes up, more and more of those particles can escape. They have a higher kinetic energy, they'll escape, to escape up in the vapor phase. The vapor phase molecules will still condense back down. But as I increase the temperature, I get a larger fraction of the molecules up in the vapor phase. When the rate of escape of the particles from the liquid to the vapor matches the rate of condensation from the vapor to the liquid, we've come to what we call a state of equilibrium. That's a big topic in Chem 2. Okay. <clears throat> so the pressure you have, the vapor pressure of the material, when you have the system at equilibrium, is called the vapor pressure. The vapor pressure will vary with temperature. As the temperature of the liquid goes up, a larger fraction of molecules escape. In the vapor phase, vapor pressure goes up. And as I go down the other way, it's, of course, going to go to the opposite of that. We'll talk about boiling points in relation to this. A boiling point of material is a temperature at which its vapor pressure equals the external pressure on it. A normal boiling point is a temperature at which the vapor pressure material equals one atmosphere. For example, if I asked you what the boiling point of, one, of water was, all, everybody would be jumping up saying it's 100 degrees Celsius. It is if I'm at one atmosphere of pressure, but you might be familiar with the idea that if I go to a high altitude like Pikes Peak, my 
pressure drops a lot, and therefore I don't have to heat it as hot to get it to boil, and therefore it's a much colder, cooler boiling temperature. As a matter of fact, at Pikes Peak, it's like 70 degrees Celsius. High altitude cooking directions have to do with paying attention to that. The water is going to be colder. If I go to, and you might have at home a pressure cooker. In a pressure cooker, you put the water in and everything else in with it, seal it all up. As it heats, it goes to a higher pressure in the atmosphere. The water can be at a higher temperature. So what we're going to use is the boiling point, the normal boiling point of these ridges will be at one atmosphere. This animation is kind of busy, and before I click on it, because it goes kind of fast, you'll see a, a container that has liquid molecules in it with vapor molecules above it. You'll see a little flame underneath it, and the flame will go from being a small, a low heat to a medium heat to high pressure, high heat. And you'll see a pressure gauge up at the top and a thermometer as well. I just spent some time doing this so you get to watch it. And you have to watch quick, because there's the setup, the pressure top. That's the low set right in there. And as we move along, it now goes to the medium temperature, medium temperature and thermometer. Pressure goes to medium temperature, more molecules up in the vapor phase. And finally, we get to the high temperature at the end. That's kind of what we're talking about when we talk about vapor pressure, about boiling point. Just a quick look at the experimental setup for the physical properties of boiling point part of the lab. Uh, down below in here, we have a hot plate set up. Up in here, just a beaker of water, 400 milliliter beaker, about two thirds filled. And inside of it, you'll see a test tube. And the test tube goes down to here. Notice carefully that down below here, at this line is where the liquid level is inside of my test tube. You don't want the liquid up above it. You want it down below. So you have it, uh, you have it pretty well immersed in the water. And up here is a temperature probe that's coming out of the lab quest down into here. And you know, the tip of the temperature probe goes just above the surface of the liquid in the test tube. It does not go into the liquid in the test tube. As the system heats up, you'll find out that it's going to start dripping off the tip of that temperature probe and get a pretty accurate measurement of what the boiling point's going to look at. So I'm going to start this thing up a little bit, and I'll put some lab quest parts in as well. I'll take a quick minute and kind of show you something about setting up the lab quest. This is only one setting you really have to mess with. Initially, when this comes up, it's going to be set to take data for three minutes and then quit taking data. Uh, turns out this will probably take you longer than that. So we need to reset that to be longer than three minutes. To make that setting change, you go up to where it says sensors up here in the sort of left part where the cursor is. Click on sensors. Come down to where it says data collection. And then in here, I can click on where it says 180 seconds and three minute default. And instead of 180, I'll put in something like 900 seconds, which is 15 minutes. And do this, tell it done, and tell it OK. And that setting's complete. So now these data, when they run them, will actually run for 900 seconds. Let me go ahead and show you this. If I start my run here, I don't have anything going on with it, but there's my run. Out here is my 900 seconds in the lower right part where the cursor is. If your run stops, if you run out of time, you're still heating up, you don't know what to do, you, what you do is you don't panic, what will happen is this red arrow, this red box will turn back to green arrow when the run's done. Just click on the green arrow again, and what it asks you to tell to append these data, and that way what will happen is you'll still keep taking data, it'll be fine. We don't really care about the time here. The only thing we care about is what's the highest temperature we get to and stay at. And so that's a quick way of kind of restarting if you run out of time. Just wanted to share that with you. Thank you. And what you'll see is we've gone through 1,233 seconds or so. Remember my 900 I set it for? Well, that wasn't enough. So all I had to do is when it ran out of 900 seconds, I just hit the green arrow that would show up in the left corner, told I wanted to append the data, and it just sticks it on top. The reason it was so slow for me was I was trying to manage all of my professional audio-video equipment. And so I was heating it kind of slowly. You can kind of tell. If you look at it in about here, then I kind of cranked it up. So I had the hot plate up pretty high at that point. Temperature's going up pretty steeply. Uh, you can, while you're watching this, if for fun, you can go up here and where it says graph. I've already done this once. You can auto scale it. it makes it more exciting. It makes it look like things are really happening faster at that point. Otherwise, it looks a little bit flat sometimes. Uh, and the corresponding video to this, what you'll end up seeing is that the um, the the water's got the bubbles in it, looks like it's starting to boil. The stuff inside doesn't particularly look like it's boiling, but vapor is starting to drop off of the temperature probe a little bit, so that's what we're measuring up here. What we're going for here is we want to see 
what the um, what the boiling point is. The boiling point is going to be the point in which the vapor pressure <laughs> of the liquid and there equals the atmospheric pressure that's on it. And what it amounts to in here is when I get to the boiling point, the, the liquid will turn into vapor, it'll hit the probe, it'll condense, it'll fall back down to the liquid. It's kind of a cyclic thing like that. And actually the temperature will flatten out until then. You may not be aware of it, but if you take an ice cube and stick a temperature probe into it at minus 10 degrees C, when it gets up to zero degrees C, it's going to stay at zero until it's melted all the ice. And the same sort of thing here in this boiling. So what we're really looking for here is a flattening of this curve at some point. back and look at the lab quest right now, what we're going to see is that in the lab quest, the temperature is starting to kind of flatten out a little bit up here. Something's happening. It's not quite going as steeply as it was. I haven't adjusted the settings at all. But you find the temperature is now going to start doing a little bit of leveling for us. <clears throat> so, anyway, so if you watch now the temperature, the temperature is getting are starting to flatten out a little bit, about 77 degrees, somewhere in that vicinity. Up there, we'll let it keep going for a little while. And what will happen is it'll flatten out. When we get to that point, that's going to be called the boiling point. This region that we're just starting to roll over here, we're rolling over about 77.9, 78 degrees, somewhere in there. Uh, we're going to let it flatten for just a minute or two and we'll be able to go back in and get a good idea of what the boiling point is at that point in time. It's where it flattens out. If we kept this going for a long time, all the liquid in the test tube would evaporate. It would be gone and the temperature would be 77. We'll be wherever this temperature would be until it actually goes away. It's a fairly good way of finding my, finding my boiling point. We use this kind of process in distillations, things like that in organic chemistry where they can separate different boiling compounds from one another based on their boiling point. Refineries. You see those big towers and refineries. Refineries, that's what you're looking at. You're taking the crude oil and you're separating the different components that have different boiling points, taking them off at different points on that tower. So this guy's settling in about 78.2, somewhere inside of there. Doesn't seem to be going much higher than that. We'll let him go for a little bit longer. And I'll show you how you can get an average boiling point. This, this is pretty much going to be 78.1, 78.2 degrees, somewhere in there. I actually looked this one up before I did it, and the boiling point of this was around 79.4. That's probably Wikipedia or somewhere, but that was the boiling point of this material. And so we're, we're pretty well in range of that. So I'm going to go ahead and stop this run. And when I stop the run, what I want to do is I want to figure out what the boiling point is. And stop it. And hit it again. Okay, there we go. Stop the run. What I want to do is I want to analyze this little section of the curve up here. And so one of the things I can do is I can just take, I could read it out and say, well, up at this point in this curve, it's like 78.1 degrees. If I want to kind of look at averaging it, it depends what your boiling point looks like. If I want to draw it, the averaging, I can just put the mouse down and drag it over here until I want to analyze the statistics for this, which means I want to know what the temperature is. At that point, 78.2 is the average, the standard deviation, you know those, right? It's like plus or minus a tenth. So we're pretty sure that our boiling point is on the order of 78.2 degrees, <laughs> somewhere in there. And so that's an example of how you would find a boiling point for these materials in this experiment. You might notice in the previous slide I misread that. It was 78.1 or 2 was the average boiling point, point the mean, 78.1 is like a maximum or the other way around. Not biggie. Uh, let's talk about the fourth property, uh, in, third property, index of refraction. 
You're probably aware of the speed that light travels in a vacuum at 186,000 miles a second, or three times 10 8 meters per second. It really gets picks them up and puts them down and moves pretty fast. When it travels through other materials, it travels more slowly than that. So even in air, it's a little slower than a vacuum, and liquids is different uh, as well. If you think about the thing where you put a spoon in a cup of water and you see it bend over, part of the reason for that, or the reason for that is because the light traveling through the air travels at a different speed than the light traveling through the water and makes gives you a different perception of that. Uh, what index refraction is all about is it looks at the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum compared to the speed of light in whatever material you're interested in. Since it travels the fastest in a vacuum, and that's going to be in the numerator, then the denominator is going to be smaller than that because it will be in water or air or whatever it's going to be, which means your index of refraction always has to be bigger than 1. The symbol we use for the index of refraction is this Greek letter eta, right in here. Right. And the way we measure that is by use something, using something called a refractometer. Refractometer looks a lot like a microscope, but it's not. It serves a different purpose than what a microscope does. What you'll see in here is you'll see an ocular piece where you can actually look through it, like you would in a microscope, but you won't see through the microscope through the refractometer at all. You'll see a surface in here, a stage, where your sample goes. So you put a liquid sample into here. This swings up over here and shuts down on top of that, and this light bulb swings up into here. And what will happen now is you'll be able to control it from a couple knobs here. One is this switch up and down, and the other one is this big control knob on the other side that you might be able to see. When I take the switch and I move it up, I get light showing through my sample, and we'll show you what I do with that in the next page. And if I take and move it down like this, then I actually see a gauge where I can read numbers for the index of refraction. Doing that, call them something like 1.3596. That would be my index of refraction for that. Very important to read all those decimal points. These index, index, indices of refraction will be very close to each other in value sometimes. And let's talk about solubility just very briefly. Solubility is the idea of putting something into a solvent and having checking to see whether it dissolves or not. We use the term sometimes miscibility. Miscible meaning that a material does mix well. So two liquids are miscible if they mix pretty well. Usually we're talking about solids into liquids, we'll talk about solubility. When we're talking about liquids and liquids, we'll use terms like miscibility, even though they're kind of the same concept. If they don't mix, it's going to be something that we call immiscible. So gasoline and water are immiscible. They are not very mixable at all. So you're going to check your solubility of your compounds, your known and your unknown, in two different solvents, water and then also in cyclohexane. Uh, so you, there's, there are instructions in the lab manual about looking for wavy things, and I thought I'd give you a little bit of a picture of that, and so that's what the next last couple slides are. Here's an example. This is water and sugar, and so on the bottom of this, I've got sugar laid in here, and then I've just got water on the top. I've got a stirring rod stuck in it as well. Let's see what happens as I take and stir that thing up. Down toward the bottom part here, you see a little bit of these wavy line types of things that we talk about. And what those amount to is those are gradients, concentration gradients. I mean, it's a little bit different concentration real close to the sugar that is a little bit away. It takes a little while for it to go into solution. If you mix it really well, stir it really well, you won't see those gradients anymore. But in the initial mixing process, you will. The other case we'll look at is the cyclohexane and water. So what you see here is on the top layer is a cyclohexane like this. Cyclohexane is less dense than water, so it floats on top. And you take these guys and stir them up very vigorously, really try to get them to mix together. What you find out in the end is... find the end is you're not going to get there. They're going to still stay as layered. That's an example of immiscible types of compounds. So that's a little rundown on the lab coming up. I hope it's going to be helpful to you in the end. And uh, please give me any comments you want to about this, these little video things, and whether they're helpful or not, and that sort of thing. Just email to gbuckley at cameron.edu. Thank you.